This past summer, I took a course on archaeology at Oxford University. We visited Stonehenge, and I was fascinated by the place. And the professor said to me, you know, if you really like this place, you should really come during the summer or the winter solstice. And you know, the idea kind of stuck with me and just kind of stayed with me. And before I knew it, I had booked a trip to Stonehenge at the winter solstice, December 22nd, 2023. Now, I really appreciated the fact that we took a course on this and sort of learned about Stonehenge before we went there because I knew what I was seeing. These circular monuments, there are hundreds of them in what we now know as the United Kingdom, and they hardly ever exist outside the UK, and nobody really knows why. So Stonehenge lies at the end of this thing that we refer to as a Circus monument. That is, a, if you picture a long American-style football field stretched out to several miles, and we walked the entire Circus monument to get to Stonehenge at the very end. Now, when we were there, this is as far as they let us go. This place has been roped off, and I understand they had to do that because of vandalism. But twice during the year at the solstice, they do let you in, and I think there's some sort of a religious exemption that requires them to do this. So during those two days of the year, you can actually just walk up and touch the rocks. So back then, this is their, our group, and you can see we don't actually get that close to Stonehenge itself, and it would be nice to get there and be much closer to the rocks. Okay, so the way this works is there's a bus that leaves from a central location in London at 4.30 in the morning, there's about an hour and a half to get there. Sun rises at 8 a.m., so you can watch the sun rise, and you're back in London by noon or 1 p.m., so you're in and out right away. So the way this works is at the summer solstice, the sun appears to rise at a point above the heel stone at the end of Stonehenge, and it casts a shadow onto the monument itself. In the wintertime, it sets at a point just behind. So in doing some preparatory research for all of this, I discovered there is a 38% chance at that time of year in that part of England that there will be clouds, rain, or snow. So the odds are actually on my side that I'll actually be able to see the sunrise. Reality, however, is different. Take a look at this weather forecast. I've never seen anything like this. It's 11 straight days of cloud, wind, and rain. Who knew that this could happen? Never happens around here, but I guess that's England. So it's a couple of days before I have to leave, and I'm going to get packing. I'm going to bring a couple of cameras, a couple of tripods, and we'll see what happens. Come along on the trip, and let's find out what happens when I go to Stonehenge. Whenever I fly to the UK, I get a flight out of Boston around 7 p.m., and then try to get four to five hours sleep on the plane. Between the flight time and the change in time zones, you get in around 6 a.m. the next morning, and the day starts all over again. Time gets crunched, and you lose a few hours, but it's workable. London subway system is quite efficient. Fares run the equivalent of about $9 U.S. at the time of filming. My hotel was in a row of townhouses in the west of London in the Kensington area, about a half a mile from the meeting point. This room is tiny. There wasn't even enough space to put my bags down. I had to stow my stuff in the closet. Here's a view out the bedroom window. So, you know, I really did appreciate taking that course on Stonehenge this past summer. It allowed me to kind of learn about it so that when we went there, I knew what I was looking at. But after taking an entire course on this, what was interesting to me is how much we don't know. It seemed as though the conclusion of the class is, we don't really know all that much. <laughs> I mean, we know certain things. Best estimates claim the age of Stonehenge to be somewhere around 4,500 years old. And we know that the stones came from anywhere from a few miles away to perhaps a few dozen miles away. After that, we don't really know a lot. It's a lot of conjecture. We don't know why they made it, and we don't even know how they made it. These are subjects of debate even today. Now, there is evidence that this was used as a burial ground. We have found human remains put in a ritualized position. There is evidence that it might have been used for some sort of a religious purpose. And we also know that it is an astronomical clock of some kind. Now, keep in mind, 4,500 years on a human scale is an enormous length of time. 
it may have been used for some of those things or all of those things. It may have sat unused for a really long time and we don't really know about it. Now as an aside, the British government has been wrestling with this idea of burying the road that comes to Stonehenge underground or in a tunnel of some kind. That's the A303 road, which gets very crowded. This is a UNESCO World Heritage Site and gets over a million visitors a year. They're concerned about the environmental impact. Now this project has been on again and off again several times for almost the past 30 years. Opponents of this idea will point out that if you dig a tunnel, you're potentially going to be causing more environmental damage. We know that this is an archaeological dig site, and you're almost certainly going to be digging something up. As of filming right now, this project is on. The morning of the solstice, I got up at 3.30 a.m. to meet the tour bus at 4.45 a.m. My body clock hasn't adjusted yet, so this means I got up at 10.30 p.m. Eastern Time to begin my day. Oh my. <laughs> of course, nobody's out at this time of the morning. The bus showed up on time and was packed with over 60 people inside. Many were still sleeping. It's about a two-hour ride to Stonehenge. Things went smoothly until we got to within one mile of the park entrance. Traffic just stopped. The tour guide said backups like this were common on this day, but we weren't moving at all. I noticed the sky was already starting to lighten. I was worried I was going to miss the sunrise. Finally, after about 15 minutes, he gave us the option to get out and just start walking the rest of the way. It would mean walking a mile to the park entrance, plus an additional 1.2 miles to Stonehenge itself. Was it worth it? I decided to take the chance. Now, I don't know if you can see this, but traffic is already backed up as far as the eye can see. Not only that, I noticed all of the parking lots in this area appeared to be full at this point. I have no idea where these people parked. The visitor center has a shuttle that takes you the final 1.25 miles, but the line was queued up all the way around the building. I decided to keep walking you can see the sky brightening quite a bit by now. Here's the final approach to the stones. There's already a mass of humanity here and more are pouring in behind me every minute. They estimated the final crowd at between three to 4,000 people. I could start to hear chanting and singing as I got closer. Look, that's Faye, the archaeology professor from this past summer. Somehow, we found each other in the crowd. We chatted and caught up. She had walked in from a distant field on the other side of Stonehenge with a group avoiding traffic altogether. It was almost impossible to get to the center of the stones. This is as close as I got. Here's the heel stone. Unfortunately, it was cloudy at sunrise. The forecast was right, so we never got to see any shadows. There were all sorts of interesting people around the stones. Here's me touching the stones. I tried not to disturb the lichen. Some claim the stones have unique acoustic properties. They say speaking or playing music in the middle will result in your sounds being amplified or reflected back towards you. Some also claim the stones themselves will resonate so you'll see people pressing their ears against them. I tried this myself and I didn't hear anything, but again, it was pretty loud out. By the way, I left my Canon 6D and the 28mm f2.8 lens on a tripod about 100 yards away, taking continuous video while I wandered around. I did this knowing full well that if someone wanted to make off with my equipment, there was very little I could do. 
but I was told that people here are generally very respectful and such things are almost unheard of. Sure enough, when I got back, the rig was still there. The bus got us back into London around 2 p.m. I had to leave early the next morning, so although I was tired, I took the subway into the city and wound up walking all around town into the afternoon and well into the night. I tried to imagine what this place looked like back in the time of Stonehenge. 4,500 years ago. A long time. It's impossible to get your mind around a number that big or a time that long ago. As I wandered around these, our modern monuments, I wondered how many of them will still be around 4,500 years from now, and if they are, what will our descendants think of them and of us?